it's a real pleasure to to join um, this discussion and and uh, and it's a couple of really important days I think and I absolutely agree with you uh, and having looked through yesterday's program uh, the intersection of what you've been discussing over two days I think is just so critically important perhaps uh, well in fact I put it stronger than that unarguably the most important issues of our time. And it is great to see a, a, uh, a Shaka University taking these issues on and not being frightened to, to talk about them, not being frightened to uh, brush them away and, and uh, trying to bring, I hope, a, a, if you like, disruptive element to, to education, to research and to a particular way of thinking. And I, I think I'd like to pick up on some of those themes uh, through the next uh, half hour or, or so. So it's a great pleasure to join you. I, I hope when, uh, when uh, COVID is behind us and, and travel becomes possible again, uh, that we'll be able to meet, meet in person. Um, but the, the virtual world has worked incredibly well over the last year and uh, it has allowed us to get together when otherwise it might have been difficult. So um, even in the darkness of still being in the midst of uh, this horrific pandemic, uh, there have been some advantages. Uh, so it's a pleasure to join you all today and look forward to any of the questions that come up uh, uh, through the talk. So to frame what I'm going to say, I'm, I'm, um, it's impossible to, to not mention SARS-CoV-2 and the COVID-19 pandemic, of course, but uh, we are living through history as it is made, uh, history that will be discussed in a hundred years time as we currently continue to discuss and try to dissect and learn from events of uh, 1918. Um, but actually I'm going to start with my comments, yes in the frame of One Health and yes in the frame of epidemics and and drug resistance and yes in the frame of the intersection of uh, everything you've described in the environmental change animal and human health uh, but i'm actually going to start uh, 20 years ago or so uh, which is actually when i first started really to get involved in emerging infections and everything that was behind it and much of, of what i'm going to say actually is framed in a in an article that uh, remarkably now, uh, wrote in June 2019, and which was published in November 2019, so a couple of months before we first became alerted to what became known as uh, uh, COVID-19. Uh, so November 2019, which was the 150th anniversary of the publication Nature. Uh, and an article published in there with colleagues from uh, India, with colleagues from uh, Europe, Africa, North America, uh, looking at 21st century science. And by science, and whenever I use science in this talk, I don't mean biomedical science at all. I mean the broad brush of science, uh, from the social sciences to agriculture, to biomedical sciences, yes, to all of the technological advances and approaches which use a scientific methodology. So if I do drop into using the word science, it is in that broad brush because I think that is the future. And I think actually looking through the background of Shaka University, I think that is what you are trying to bring together and to ask people to think differently. And that's something I have huge admiration for uh, and, and respect. Um, and whilst I frame this around epidemics, because I think that is the, the topic of the moment and, and the topic of some of the discussion through today, uh, the central theme is actually about integration. It is about learning how in every sector, from education into politics, into how organizations are put together, uh, how agencies are run at a regional, national, and a global level. Uh, and it's about trying to move on from, I think, an era which has been successful in science, but has been defined in many ways by a reductionist approach, where we take things down to their smallest possible element, and we try and understand that single element in the absence of seeing it as part of something bigger. And I think we'll, we are going to have to define our future by the ability to have the power of reductionist approaches complemented but added to, synergized, not just added, synergized with an ability to think in a complex systems approach and not be daunted by that. 
Um, and I'll finish off with some comments about how I think we need to bring the strength of reductionist approach with the strengths of complex thinking. But I don't think either of those two disciplines, if that's what we want to call them, has really got it right yet. And I think that is the disruption we need. And it needs to start in the education sector. And that's where universities, I think, are just so critical because they drive thinking in different ways. Um, and they need to be bold in how they do that. And I think this is what will define the 21st century. So I'm going to take us back actually to almost exactly 20 years uh, before the start of the SARS-CoV epidemic, pandemic, uh, to an event that in Malaysia, uh, which was the uh, emergence of another new human virus. Uh, it became known as Nipah uh, after a small town in part of Malaysia. And at the time I was living in Vietnam and, and, uh, and was involved in this through some colleagues in Malaysia. Um, but I think the story is very important to remember and has got largely forgotten actually, because the story I think tells us so much about the, the threat and the vulnerabilities uh, we are to emerging infections and indeed drug resistance, which I absolutely agree with you is part of the emerging infection story. But it's more than about medicine, it's about society, it's about tensions, it's about inequalities, it's about uh, tensions between cultures, between language groups, between religious groups. It's about agriculture and farming, it's about uh, bringing epidemiology, public health and societal understanding together and thinking about them together. Um, it's also though, and this I think goes back to the challenge of a reductionist approach, it's also about continuation bias, where you set off on a route and you think you're, you know where you're going in a linear way, and you think A to B is a straight line, but in fact it's often not. And I think through the reductionist science that we've largely pushed forward over the last 20 or 30 years, We've lost that capacity to iterate, to learn as we go along, and we've set a path at the start, which we've then just kept to, in spite of uh, evidence and, and insight that may have taken us in a different direction. And I think that uh, the, the power of continuity bias, which is basically, let's keep doing what we're doing despite all the evidence around us, and let's keep all our preconceived notions of what's happening here uh, and let's pursue those almost to the inability to see a non-linear path, to see around the corners. And I think the only way to, to, to avoid continuity bias, which has been so prevalent over the last 12 months during COVID, uh, is to have diverse inputs into our thinking and have the courage and the confidence to be able to work at the interfaces between what we currently call disciplines. So the Nipper outbreak in Malaysia in 1998, it started in about September of 98, and it went through really until the May of the following year, 1999, started in a province of Malaysia, state of Malaysia, um, Perak, and also Negeri and uh, Salanga in Malaysia. Um, and it was first picked up by, uh, in the agriculture sector, because uh, people working in the agriculture, pig, pig farming in particular, Pig farmers noticed that their pigs were getting sick um, and they reported this within the system. Uh, but a little bit later, uh, the health community, the human health community, started to notice that some of the pig farmers uh, were getting sick with encephalitis. Uh, now the encephalitis was thought early on to be Japanese encephalitis. Japanese encephalitis is endemic in that part of Malaysia. It's particularly common at that time of year. Uh, and the, there was a disconnect between the fact that pig farmers were getting sick and the pigs were themselves getting sick. Um, that does not happen in Japanese encephalitis. Pigs are, do carry the Japanese encephalitis virus, but they don't get sick with it. And secondly, on the human health side, there was an assumption early on that it was Japanese encephalitis, but actually it didn't really fit with Japanese encephalitis. Japanese encephalitis is endemic in Malaysia, and most uh, people who get Japanese encephalitis get sick are mostly young people, uh, children, uh, uh, teenagers. It's rare to see Japanese encephalitis in an endemic part of the world in people of middle age. Uh, and yet it was such a strong feeling 
that this was Japanese encephalitis, that that confirmation bias, continuity bias, just kept going uh, to the point actually that there was a decision made to vaccinate large numbers of pigs against Japanese encephalitis to prevent them spreading Japanese encephalitis virus around Malaysia. Uh, unfortunately, in the agricultural sector, a decision was made to vaccinate those pigs for Japanese encephalitis uh, using the same syringes uh, as they went around pig farms. And indeed, that public health intervention on the agriculture side meant that uh, by using the same syringes in multiple farms, uh, more of this, uh, what turned out to be Nipah virus, was then spread around the community further than perhaps it needed to be had the uh, confirmation bias not led people in a very, very blinkered way to think about what was going on. Some point later, um, actually, uh, a sample from a human patient uh, was uh, taken and five days later, uh, a new uh, virus was identified called, now, uh, subsequently to be called the Nipah virus from a small town where this was first identified. Um, during that time, uh, and this goes to the whole sense of a, a broad approach to issues such as emerging infections, but again, I think this is so true of ecological change and environment change. It also raised very marked tensions within communities. Pig farming in Malaysia is a preserve of a certain sector of society. Uh, you'll appreciate everybody that Malaysia has a very diverse community, uh, very diverse culturally, language-wise, linguistically, uh, tradition, traditions are very different, and indeed religions are different. And the pig farming is, is uh, the preserve of a certain part of that community. And the fact that this was associated with pig farming, pig farmers were getting sick, and pigs were seen to be the center of it, led to tensions within that community, which paid for many, many months through this and led to, again, influencing in the way that the approach was taken. And so for me, the Nipah virus of 1999 epidemic in Malaysia, and as you're sure aware as well, this subsequently, although it has uh, been uh, eradicated now, as far as we know in Malaysia, it has now become endemic in uh, Bangladesh. And a few years ago, there was an outbreak uh, in Kerala in southern India. Uh, the pigs are effectively uh, an end host of this. Uh, and the vector, if you like, is the fruit bat. Uh, and it's in fact the fruit bat uh, urine as the fruit bats gather in very big colonies and then they pass urine. Uh, the virus is in the urine and it infects pigs and then from pigs into humans and directly sometimes from bats into humans. And so this Nipper outbreak of 1998 to 1999, uh, for me personally, was the first time I really got involved in emerging infections. But it was also, in my view at least, uh, alongside the outbreak of H5N1 in, in Hong Kong in 1997, was really the start of a 20-year cycle which led us through Nipper through bird flu, H5M1, through SARS-1 in particularly China, Southeast Asia, and Canada, uh, through the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome uh, epidemic, which is still going on in the Middle East, of course, to Ebola in West Africa, and today in Guinea and the Democratic Republic of Congo, to the pandemic of 2009, H1N1, to the emergence of Zika virus, the re-emergence of Zika virus in Central and South America, a few years ago, but also to the continued spread uh, and expansion of dengue, of chikungunya, and as mentioned in the introduction of drug resistant uh, infections. All of these, all of those, um, some of those most emerging issues of the last 20 years, firstly, they've become more frequent uh, and they've become more complex. And the reason they've become more frequent is not because of biomedicine, the viruses may have evolved, they may have changed, but they haven't changed dramatically. The Ebola outbreak in 2014 to 2016 in West Africa was not driven by a change in the virus. It wasn't driven by a change in the immune status of people. It wasn't driven uh, by some change in the uh, genetics of the virus or, or of humans. It was changed because of ecological change, of agricultural practices, of environment change, land use change, urbanization, trade and travel. It wasn't the virus that changed, it was the ecological system in which the virus was 
uh, finding a home, if you like. And that changed the Ebola outbreak of 2014 to 16 from essentially a historical rural outbreak to one that was happening in huge cities in West Africa and led to over 11,000 people dying. The same is true of each of those epidemics that I've talked about. Uh, it has not been the biomedical side which has driven the emergence and impact of those epidemics. It has been the human animal interface. It has been the changing ecology. It's been the changing of land use. It has been the um, uh, fact that humans now live in huge cities which are highly connected, densely populated, and connected both regionally and internationally. It has been driven by that combination uh, of all of those factors which have led to those emergence uh, of new infections. And I think the reason I say that is if we don't appreciate that, that is the those are the drivers, then if we just focus on the epidemics themselves, uh, uh, the development of vaccines, diagnostic and treatment, which I have been uh, very involved in over the last 12 months. But if we only focus on the outcome, in other words, the epidemic, and we don't appreciate that these complex drivers, these complex systems drivers, are the actual origins of these devastating epidemics and pandemics, then I believe we will continue to have to respond to them rather than preventing them, which is always a better option. And I think it's that shift we have to make as a result of COVID-19 experience now uh, to appreciate that those drivers I talk about, the human animal interface, changing ecology, changing environment, climate change, urbanization, societal change, travel and trade. Those are the drivers and they are all not, they're all going to increase, if you like, in the 21st century. They're not going to go away. They're, if anything, they, those drivers are now so much part of the world that we live in that they're not going to dissipate or get less. And therefore, we're going to have to work out much better ways to appreciate those drivers and both adapt and mitigate them if we're going to stop these very frequent and increasingly complex epidemics. I also think when you then come through to thinking of the impact of these epidemics, it is also inappropriate to think of them as just a primary health issue. Um, and I've portrayed the impact of these epidemics in a similar vein to the complex systems approach of the drivers of the epidemic. I think we have to see the impact of the epidemics in an equally systems approach. And the way I in my own mind, simplistically have sort of portrayed now the impact of the epidemics is to frame it in the context of four overlapping circles. And again, as with the origins of the epidemics, with the impact of the epidemics, I think we have to address each of these circles if we want to uh, reduce the impacts they have in the future. And these overlapping circles, are they start at the heart of it, and you can think of this as if you threw a small stone into a lake or, a, or a, a, a body of water, and you saw the ripple effect of a small circle, a, a bigger effect of the second circle, the third circle is even bigger, and the fourth circle is even larger. And they all interconnect, they all are driven by each other, and they all iterative back and forth between them. And those four circles are at the heart, at the, number, at the central bit of it, in fact, the smallest bit of it potentially, is the direct health consequence of the epidemic itself. That is the illness created by COVID-19, by Nipah, by SARS-1, uh, whichever of the other emerging infections you want to talk about. It's the direct health consequences for individuals and for communities uh, as a result of the illness and the tragedy of deaths, uh, for instance, from COVID-19. The second circle, is the indirect health consequences. That is the consequences on every other aspect of health, such that when you have the sort of crisis that India has lived through, through the first wave of COVID-19, uh, the UK is uh, in the, in, just beyond the peak of its third wave, the indirect health consequences are even bigger 
than the direct health consequences. And what I mean by the indirect consequences are the impact on every other aspect of healthcare. It's very difficult to have the uh, uh, overwhelming crisis of a COVID-19 pandemic and deliver uh, cancer care, vaccination programs, maternal child health, uh, care for people with diabetes, surgery, and critically, and affects all of us, is mental health and well-being. It is almost impossible to have a functioning health system when you're under the sort of pressure of an epidemic in West Africa, of Ebola, or the pandemic of 2019, 2020, 2021. The third circle, in some ways, is even bigger and potentially longer lasting, and that is the effect on the whole of society. The economics, the loss of jobs, the loss of education that will blight a generation for many years to come. The impact on trade, uh, the impact on trust between the governed and the governing. Uh, when governments are not there for people in a crisis, there is a question of, of the trust between governments and the public and the, communi and the community. Um, uh, inequality, uh, uh, pandemics do not affect the world equally. They, are, they, they highlight inequality, they raise tensions between and within society, and they raise tensions between societies. Uh, we saw that in Nipper, and I've described that because of the nature of society where the pig farming was going on. It has happened in COVID-19. It's happened in every epidemic. There is tensions within all of our societies. And when you add a crisis to that, particularly one which is so difficult to deal with, like Nipper or, or, or SARS-2, uh, COVID-19, it highlights those uh, inequalities uh, that exist in all our societies and leads to tensions. And then the fourth circle, um, which uh, is hugely important, and that is the impact on geopolitics. When we came into the COVID-19 pandemic, there were tensions between East and West, there were tensions between East and West, North and South, uh, there were tensions between the US and China, we know that, and it isn't a coincidence that I think that the impact of the pandemic has been worse than it possibly could have been uh, because of those tensions. Blaming one, country blaming another, one region blaming another, within countries blaming one sector of society or another. Uh, we faced similar geopolitical crises, of course, in the 20th century, uh, and we need to learn lessons about how we did it. And when we come eventually through this crisis, as we eventually will, we must learn that the world is better by working together, that these crises, whether of epidemics, climate change, energy use, land use, water use, whatever it is that we're going to face in the 21st century, that we cannot address those through individual nationalistic approaches. They are by their nature transborder, they're transcontinent, and unless we uh, look at and reform our existing structures and appreciate the world is a very, very small place, and you are at risk in Delhi of something emerging in West Africa, you're at risk in London of something emerging in Wuhan. Uh, you're at risk in Washington if climate change continues in other parts of the world. So unless we can learn the lessons from COVID as the first major crisis of the 21st century, then I fear we're likely to repeat the crises later in the 21st century. And that was something we did in, of course, the 20th century when events of the early part of the century were not learned. And we went on to repeat them later to devastating impact. And yet through all of this, as we change from the power of reductionist siloed thinking and vertical structures, and they do bring power, there is great merit in depth of knowledge and expertise. But as we go through into the 21st century and we face these more complex systems issues, and yet we retain a very vertical set of structures. And that starts very early. It starts in education. Many universities, and I hope Ashoka takes a different approach to this, but many of our seats of learning around the world are still organized into disciplines, into faculties, into almost competing fiefdoms within a structure. Uh, our funding agencies, and you know, I'm here in part representing Welcome, as, as you say, one of the second largest um, charity in the world, and I think the largest one supporting science uh, uh, and, and uh, health sciences. Uh, we work in a very siloed way. Uh, we're not good at integrating across silos. Uh, we judge grants very much by the strength of their depth of knowledge rather than thinking how could they integrate across, uh, across their work. Governments don't have faculties, of course, but they have ministries. 
And those ministries are often competing for funding. They often see the world differently. We have ministries of agriculture. We have ministries of human health. We have ministries of finance. We have ministries of education. And when governments are stressed by the sorts of events of, the, of uh, COVID-19, they find it extraordinarily difficult to work as a one government approach across all sectors of society. So for instance, an example of that in the UK, we know very well that the health issues that we are currently struggling with are very much influenced by what happens in the education sector. Uh, children and young adults have been a major driver of transmission, of course. This has been true in every country. And yet it's been very difficult to integrate the health and the education sector in a crisis. If you try and create integration at a time of crisis, you will fail because the languages of the silos, the languages of the faculty, the culture of the faculties, the culture of the ministries, the demands for money, the competition between all of those, faculty, funder, ministries, governments, intergovernment agencies, are such that if you try and integrate those in a time of crisis, it's extraordinarily difficult. And in my experience, at least you generally fail. It would be like having, and I don't particularly like the analogies to the military, but it'd be like having an army, a navy, and an air force who have never worked together until they faced a war when they had to work together. You don't do that. Those agencies work together and they make sure that they're integrated and their systems are integrated so that they can work seamlessly when put in a crisis situation. We're not good about that in almost any other sector. And again, it comes back to the theme of today and yesterday's discussion. If we look at the issues that you are taking on at Ishaka University and with partners in, in Plymouth and elsewhere around the world, uh, I think we have to stand back and we have to do this as a funding body as well. We have to stand back and think, how can we gain the best from the deep expertise of reductionist science? How can we gain the best of that that it's given, but learn to work in a more integrated way across disciplines and within disciplines? Uh, I don't think the reductionist scientists have quite got that yet. It's difficult for me, I have to admit that. I think the systems scientists, for want of a better phrase, have also not quite got it yet. I think often uh, multidisciplinarity is sometimes a loose word for an acceptance of less expertise and less knowledge. So I don't think either of these extremes, reductionist scientists, complex systems thinkers, has quite got it right yet. And I think Ashaka University, who is going to try and develop a new way of thinking about this, I think is absolutely going to be at the forefront of how to integrate these. We need to bring the strengths of reductionist science and expertise and deep knowledge. And we need to interface that with a willingness to work across borders, across boundaries, scientific boundaries, as well as national boundaries, and work how we can integrate these in a better way. Because they will ultimately, if we are going to address any of the great challenges of the 21st century, and you could name any of them, and I've been through some of them, uh, if we're going to address those to both address the root causes of them, rather than just respond to the impact of them, then I think we have to be willing to bring together these disciplines and think of it in a different way, which at the moment, I don't think the complex systems approach or the reductionist science has really quite got it right yet. And we're all struggling with this. We need the strengths of both, we need people with deep expertise who are comfortable working at the interface and are willing to partner and collaborate with others. We need people that can stand back and not just look for the confirmation and continuity bias of a linear approach to the world where A and B are in a direct line because they often won't be. We need to be diverse in the groups of people we bring together and we need to be inclusive to their ideas. And we also need people that can both see in a linear approach but are also able and willing to stand back and see the bigger picture and also have a capacity, and this is tricky to, to educate, it's tricky to develop, but I think it does come out of the sorts of uh, environment you're trying to create at the university, the ability to see round corners and the ability and willingness to bring together your deep expertise with the expertise of others and respect all of them and respect what they can bring to the equation. And then finally, we have to integrate all of these, whether it be human and animal interfaces, ecology, land use, biodiversity, the environment, urban planning, urbanization, trade and travel. But we also have to bring that with political nows. 
we have to integrate ethics into it, not as an add-on at the end, but as an integral part of the thinking at the start. We have to address the tensions between societies and within societies, and we have to address the issues of inequalities, which ultimately is one of the great drivers of all of these issues. So unless we can bring all those together with political nous, negotiation skills, and an appreciation of how societies will be functioning in the 21st century, I think we will continue to be responding to epidemics, to drug resistance, to the impact of climate change. Eventually, we'll be, essentially, we'll be treating the symptoms rather than treating the underlying driver and causes. And I'll finish that I think we need to train, we need to provide, we need to encourage people that can ask why not, and people that can ask what if, rather than just reporting what we're seeing today. And I'll finish with that and hand back to you and very happy to stay on to take any questions, criticisms, challenge or anything else. Thank you very much. A wonderful talk. It's, it's very difficult for me to paraphrase what you said. And what you said towards the end is, I guess in a sense, a somewhat gloomy message. And then there was a little bit of joy towards the end of it. But the idea that some of this is, in a sense, irreversible and inherent in the way that we live, trade networks across countries, unrestricted travel, urbanization, the, the inevitable needs of a population that is growing. Was that, I mean, do you sort of, when you think about this, do you think of it as, do you see the gloom or do you see any hope at the end of it? That's, it's fascinating because I, I don't see the gloom. <laughs> I, 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 I think sometimes you have to appreciate um, the darkest part of the night is just before the dawn. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, uh, I, my, I came through a family. My, my, I'm the youngest of six children. I, my parents were more, more elderly when I, by the time I was born. You know, they came through, uh, uh, their parents came through the First World War. They, they were, my father was a prisoner of war for six years during the Second World War, and yet he never lost the sense, we've seen the worst, and it's in our hands to make the better. And that's how I feel today. We, we have, we've now realized that many of the warnings that you and other people and, and uh, have raised over the last 20 years of these challenges, unless you face those challenges, you appreciate them, and you actually believe they're real challenges, I don't think you can really move humanity forward. And therefore, I think the darkest day of night is just before the dawn. And I think we're at that moment now. I actually feel incredibly optimistic that this shock will actually shake us all um, to look forward and appreciate what the 21st century brings. So I know I feel very optimistic. I feel very optimistic about uh, the ability of science, the broadly defined science uh, to address these challenges. Uh, and I'm a great believer that humanity can actually, when it finally has to, provide solutions. That, that's nice to hear. Um, I particularly like the analogy that you drew to these widening circles, I've got a small circle in the center being the actual, the direct impact of the pandemic itself. But then the larger circles, and in a sense, the, the sort of the, the, the steeper circles being the indirect effects. And the last one being the trust that people repose in their governments, the knock-on effects on trade and inequality increase as a consequence of that. This is, it's not very easy to convince people in government and in policy that these larger circles should also be paid attention to even while you address a smaller central circle, which is a direct consequence of, of, the, of the pandemic. And I don't see much discussion around that. So what would you suggest? What is your approach to dealing with this? when you think about policy, when you discuss, but to remind people of these larger circles? You know, despite myself, you know, despite being uh, a clinician uh, and, and then a clinician first and a public health person second, I think actually starting with the bigger circle is where we've, we've got to at least have the, uh, it's what I call the political nows, to start with that bigger circle, because I'm afraid we have to appreciate that the big decision makers in government and in international agencies are mostly driven by the bigger circle. I may 
be focused personally on the patient in front of me or on the public health issue in the second circle. But I absolutely uh, understand why that policymakers, politicians, and 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 have to see at the start actually the bigger circle, because the bigger circle is also part of other things beyond health, education, and all the things I mentioned. And so therefore, I think uh, when we construct these arguments, debates, and when we set up universities, we should be thinking from the inside out, but we must think from the outside in. Mm -hmm because I think that's how we have to be able to frame it. We have to have that integration and ultimately be able to paint that narrative that if we, if we don't do the inner circle, these are the bigger external consequences. So I don't think we can just start at the first circle and work out. I think we've also got to have the ability to start at the outer circle and work in. Thanks. Professor Malvika Sarkar, who's the Vice Chancellor of Ashoka University has reminded me in a note that that the, the, the Center for Climate Change and Sustainability does seek to bring together the sort of very integrated approach to problem solving that, that you mentioned, that, that to correct continuity bias by bringing in people from many different areas, including the humanities, including literature, to find out what the historical, what is the historical precedent that people have written about, if often informally, to, to further our understanding of diseases, climate change, all of these questions. But I had a very specific question for you in this regard. As a young university that's still, in a sense, refining its curriculum, we don't have the weight of history behind us. We're not an 800 year old institution. How do we construct an education that really tells people or teaches young students to be more mindful of these larger questions, especially, I mean, public health being just one of them, but really the fact that a whole lot of different things interlock together? And these are exactly, as you said, these are complex systems. They have many different parts together. How do you train people to think like that? I think that's, that, that, that's both the challenge. It's also the great opportunity though. And I think this approach, I would argue, and I'm, I'm here sitting in Oxford, you know, at, at whatever it is, 800 year institution. I, I, I think that the, this different way of thinking is more likely to come from disruptive elements that are, that are new or, and, and do not need to necessarily follow an existing model. Um, uh, I think that does need though, not just thinking about the faculty members or university members, I, I don't like the title use of faculty, uh, but it is also about the students. It's about their parents. It's about uh, educating again the whole of society because society on the whole is quite traditional, it's quite conservative, wherever you are. It sees what you did as a student as the sort of template for the future and I don't believe that to be true. Um, I think the opportunity here is for a new faculty, new university, which is why I was so happy to join you today because I, uh, I, I just think you as a new agency need to be confident and bold in what you're doing uh, because you've got the opportunity with a blank sheet of paper almost to think differently. I, this again goes to your question of, of gloom or optimism. I also think, and this, this may, I, I also think the so called, whatever the younger generation means, I think intuitively they get this better than my generation does. Um, I think that's partially the way social media works. I think it's partially the way the internet works. I think partially it's the way their access to information works. And I think I see more willingness to embrace this amongst a younger generation than I do from my generation. Thank you. So here's a specific question that, that's coming to you, I think in, in your capacity as the head of the Wellcome Trust saying that early career researchers in the global South have poor and limited platforms to be research leaders. How does one address this? And how, I mean, this is due to the academic culture. This is the question. How does the Wellcome Trust aim to support this better? And is this is important yeah, that, what are you doing at the moment? That is a great question. Um, I, I do, it, it was not my idea and it, it came before my time at the Wellcome, but I, but I do think the, the India Alliance, whilst uh, I would love to see it 10 times bigger, um, uh, I'd love to see it uh, a much, much, more encompassing and a broader approach. Um, 
I would love to see, this is very important now for Welcome, uh, in my time at Welcome, I, I think building uh, a research culture into that is very, very, very important. Uh, uh, I think encouraging uh, diverse voices and embracing inclusion, I think is very, very important to its future. Uh, and I think giving platforms uh, to people uh, of all generations is very important. Um, yeah, I was lucky in many ways to have a, a sort of voice and a platform, you know, younger than perhaps might have been achieved today, where we, again, I think we've become too conservative and we too often turn to people uh, because of their reputation, not because of the work they're doing today. And I think this, this does need challenging. Uh, it needs challenging at welcome and to welcome. Uh, uh, it needs challenging towards the India Alliance. Um, but if, if not challenged, then organizations don't change. Um, uh, because, and funding agencies in particular don't change because people feel anxious about challenging funding agencies because they are also writing a check or providing grant funding. I think it's just absolutely critical to constructively challenge your agencies, including the Injury Alliance, including Welcome, to ask for this to change, but because otherwise they won't change. Thanks. There's another question about while I understand, so I'm, I'm paraphrasing the question. While I understand your statement on reductionist science, why did you say that system scientists haven't got it got it right yet? <laughs> Mainly to be provocative, because I knew most of the people on this call would be systems people. I, I, I it's it's not a comment on on Shaka University at all, but but I, I I have a bit of a concern that sometimes when these buzzwords become so much so easy to say multidisciplinarity interdisciplinarity etc that that sometimes it's been an excuse for superficiality uh, as well and i i and when i say they haven't got it quite right i'm i'm pushing both to the extreme to make a point of course many systems uh, approach people I, I was talking recently to the ipcc and and i think they've done a great job at integrating in a very strong systems approach way uh, the, the work on climate change over the last 20 or 30 years. But I, I think what we mustn't do as we move to a systems approach is ignore the value of expertise and, and deep knowledge. What you, in an ideal world you'd have is people coming together with deep knowledge, but the willingness to work at the interface. Um, when I, one of the best lessons I've heard was when I was a, a, neuro, a young neurologist, because uh, uh, I originally trained in neurology working in Edinburgh and the person I was working with and for at that stage said something to me this would be in the mid 80s and it's stuck with me since then is that the most interesting parts of science and research and progress are made at the interfaces between people where people with great knowledge come together and see the excitement at the interface and he was absolutely right in 1986 when he said that to me and you know here 30 years later that single statement that he made over a coffee has stayed with me. And I think he was absolutely right there. We need the great strength of knowledge coming together with the humility to work with others. And I, I, I think there are few places that actually where you achieve that yet. And again, that would be a great opportunity for Shaka University, I think, to take a lead, leadership role in that. Thank you. So that, that's a natural segue to the next question, which is, you know, it, it thanks you for your talk. It said it was very inspiring and a challenge. It says, Despite some of the things we got wrong along the way over the last year, as I have been mostly encouraged by the broad range of experts who have come together to work together to answer questions on COVID. How do you think we can build on this and maintain the momentum that we have so far? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. And I, I, I think, you know, there's been a tragedy probably 2 million, my guess is perhaps closer to 4 million people have died so far in in almost, it's just under a year really, or a year or so. So there's a huge amount um, to, to, to be sorrowful for. Um, but there's a, there is a lot of positive. I absolutely agree with you. Uh, just as one example of that, and I picked this example uh, because it, it um, not because of the places it happened, but because of the, you, you took a, a relatively small biotech company that span out of academia in Germany, led by uh, an immigrant into Germany from a Turkish heritage, uh, working together with a multinational. Uh, the biotech had been working on cancer, uh, had not really paid any attention to infectious diseases, but the technology uh, 
uh, the two of them as the leaders of that group, uh, uh, he and she brought it together and said this could work in another area. That to me is an example of coming together across borders, across boundaries, across disciplines, and something good has come from it. And that could be re replicated in, in many, many parts. The open willingness to share the information, the willingness to share the data uh, across borders and across boundaries, the, uh, you know, coming to India now, the willingness of, of India to, to both uh, make own vaccines, to produce vaccines from others, to make them available to neighboring countries in South Asia, and to now be manufacturing for, for the world. Um, this gives me great hope. And, and uh, again, as somebody reminded me recently, you know, at a time when, of course, US and China have been arguing over many things the last five, 10 years, somebody reminded me that at the height of the Cold War, uh, Russian scientists uh, and US scientists worked together to eradicate the world of smallpox. And, and I think science, can play a critical role here that as politicians argue and trade disputes go on or worse than that scientists can work freely across borders with the ethos and values of science uh, and the commitment to making the world a better place and i think science and science diplomacy has actually been a, a, a light in this pandemic uh, and i think uh, bringing that into the political sphere would be a very positive move thank you Here's a quick question from Vaibhav Sinha saying, how do we, you talked about the need to de-silo many of these different areas to get them to talk to each other. How do you do this faster rather than slower? So the normal pace of academia is slow. Is, is there any way we can convince, how does one get about convincing politicians, policymakers, et cetera, that this needs to be done fast as opposed to over some slow time scale? Yeah, again, I, I, I think that's one of the other lessons that, that science has moved at a phenomenal pace. Uh, I would also say that um, money has been made available to scientists and greater flexibility in what scientists have done, whether it be from the Indian government, uh, the companies in India, the Wellcome Trust, the NIH in the United States. There was much more flexibility given to the recipients of grants to say, do what you think is right. I think there's a lesson to be learned for all funding bodies there, uh, which is ultimately to trust scientists to do the right thing, uh, to give them maximum flexibility to pursue their dreams uh, and their ideas, and also to accept um, that not all science will work. Um, not all the vaccine constructs, not all the therapeutic options, not all the public health interventions that have been dreamed up in the last 12 months have worked. Um, but I think funding agencies, again, have become too conservative. They've so wanted to make sure they don't fund something that, that might be bad, that they're missing out on great innovation. Uh, and I think uh, national and indeed philanthropic funding bodies need to be more willing to take risk. Uh, yes, to back younger people with ideas that may not seem backed up with long streams of CVs and publications. Uh, but if you look at the really innovative sectors of society in the last 20 or 30 years, they've mostly been driven by people following their dreams uh, and by disrupting existing ways of doing things. And I think the broad scientific uh, uh, can learn something from that. Thank you. So this is my last question, and it's my question, not, not, not from, from someone else. What should be the relationship between working scientists and policy? Is it good for working scientists to involve themselves more deeply and more intimately with policy, or does that run the risk of the fact that once you're aware of policy constraints and policy issues, that you may tailor your advice, your scientific advice, to accommodate that? What would you suggest for working scientists with regarding this question? Uh, I... I think it, it's, um, it goes beyond policy, actually. I think it goes to the broader invo engagement, involvement and communication. And, and I, think, I think all of those, you know, scientists have um, felt uncomfortable uh, uh, talking to the media, to communicating, communicating with the public, communicating with politicians. Uh, we have not got, in India, UK, we have not got enough scientists working in politics. Uh, uh, most houses of government are dominated uh, by non-scientists. Uh, I think that needs to be rebalanced. Uh, 
one of the lessons of 2020 is just how critical it is that evidence and data and insights are put into policy making. And so I think uh, a scientist that chooses to go into policy, into the media, into communications, into engagement involvement of the public, and indeed into party politics, is to be applauded. The end result of a training in science is not necessarily to be a scientist. And I think we as scientists do have a responsibility to see our role in the broader society and as part of culture, and that includes politics.